This video is going to cover probably what's the most challenging topic in AP computer science principles, and that is algorithmic efficiency and undecidable problems or undecidability. So in this lesson, I'm actually going to cover both of these because these are kind of topics that go in pairs. It's also going to be a slightly longer video because I'm going to cover both together and because I'm going to actually start by going over a little bit of the math that's relevant for algorithmic efficiency. Part of this is also tough because this class doesn't really have the math requirement that might make it easier to understand algorithmic efficiency, particularly combinatorics, things like factorial, and even things like understanding polynomial math a little better. So I'm going to cover those briefly. When we talk about algorithmic efficiency, we talk about it in terms of input size. So imagine we have a list with five items. So here's a list with five items, five, three, nine, two, and seven. Those are the five items. If we make an algorithm where this list is the input, n is going to be five because there's five items in the list. That's the input size here. So for example, let's say we have an algorithm that looks at this list so that we can see whether or not the number nine is in there. That is going to generally want to look through all of the items. It might stop early if it finds the items, but let's say the item is not in the list. Let's say, for example, that nine is not in this list. We are going to have to look through all five items of the list in order to see that nine is not there. So in other words, we're going to look through all n items where n is five. We say generally that this does n checks, right? So this would take n checks if the item is not in the list. This type of algorithm is considered linear. It grows with the size of the list. So if the list has 10 items, we're gonna to need to look through 10 items if the number is not in the list. This is a linear algorithm. All right, now let's say we have a new list. And in this case, the list has also five items. So n is five, but now the values are one, two, three, four, and five. And now say we're gonna make a different algorithm. And this algorithm, we are going to multiply each item in this list by each other item in the list, including itself, right? So you might think about this kind of as a multiplication table, right? We multiply each item by each other item. So with an input size of five, where n is five, this will take 25 actions, and you can actually see it here in the table. We have 25 different possible interactions. This is what we call n squared, right? n times n, or quadratic number of operations. But keep in mind that mathematically, both n and n n square are considered polynomial. So is n to the third, or n cubed, or even n to the 10,000. n to the any constant number is going to be considered a polynomial, as long as that number is constant. This is going to come up later when we talk about unreasonable execution times. To complete the cycle here, let's talk a little bit about constant time. Constant time algorithms always take the same number of steps. So for example, let's say we're just adding two numbers, right? We have input A and input B, and we're just adding them. That's always going to take exactly one action. It's just going to take an addition. That's constant time. Same, for example, if you want to check just the first item in a list to see if it's greater than zero. If your algorithm is just checking if the very first item in a list is greater than zero, this is always going to take exactly one operation. Or maybe you want to check if just the first three items are greater than zero. Since it's a constant check of three, it's always going to be constant. No matter how big your list gets, you're always going to check exactly three items. This is a constant time operation. That's basically what constant is. There's not much more to it. So next, let's talk briefly about logarithmic time. Logarithmic is something that comes up when we talk about binary search in particular, but it's not the only logarithmic algorithm. For this class, it's the only one we really need to know about, though. So logarithmic happens when you divide your input by some amount, usually half in APTSV each time. So for example, if you have an input that has 100 items, and after every step you divide it by two, your list is going to get pretty small pretty quickly. So that makes these algorithms very efficient. So to wrap things up, when we talk about algorithmic efficiency, linear, quadratic, and all polynomial types, such as cubed and even very big polynomials, are all considered reasonable time algorithms. We'll get into more what that means in a bit when we start doing our problems. Same with constant and logarithmic. Those are all reasonable time algorithms. Next, let's talk a little bit about unreasonable time algorithms. Unreasonable time algorithms are those which have exponential or factorial efficiencies. So these are things where as the input gets bigger, they grow to require many steps very, very quickly. So I'm not going to get into too much depth about the math in this section because actually it turns out that the amount that you need to understand these concepts isn't that much for APCSP. It's basically what I'm about to cover right here. And I'll give some common examples to help out. 
So generally you get exponential efficiency when you're talking about all combinations of things. So a common example would be, what are all the possible groups of people that you can get with these five people? If you get more and more people in that list, it's going to get pretty big pretty quickly. A common exponential algorithm might require 2 to the n steps. It's pretty common. That's 2 to the power of n. So know that when n is just 32, you're already in the billions of steps. So compare this to 32 squared, so basically n squared, where n is 32, which is just about 1,000, right? Or 32 cubed, 32 to the power of 3, is still only in the thousands. So you see that these numbers grow much slower than exponential numbers. Finally, factorial numbers, usually written as n with an exclamation point, as though you're yelling out n. So for example, 5 exclamation point would be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So this type of thing usually grows very quickly as well, sometimes faster than some exponential uh, initially, and then eventually they slow down. Usually you'll get a factorial when you're looking for all combinations of something without repeating one of the items. A common example would be all combinations of letters A, B, C, D, and E without repeating each letter. This is going to lead to factorial types of efficiencies. Exponential and factorial algorithms are pretty common, and we consider these to be unreasonable in efficiency. We'll get to what that means when we start solving some of the problems. And with that, let's actually start looking at some problems. All right, so here's a fairly typical list iteration problem, and this is actually a great problem to start looking into algorithmic efficiency. So there's a lot going on here, but all we really need to focus on is this very small part here, which is that there's this function here called analysis, and that analysis takes about one hour to return a result, right? And also fairly important is that everything else happens pretty much instantaneously, which means in terms of runtime, we only need to worry about calling analysis, and things like display, for each, if, all that stuff doesn't really take any time. So let's take a look at down here in this function over here, how many times we use analysis? Because the question is asking the amount of time that it takes to execute this program. So what we can tell is that over here we're calling analysis, and we're also calling analysis down here. But pretty importantly, this happens inside a for each loop right here. So we need to figure out how many times this is happening in here. How many times we call this analysis in here? This one we only call once. Right? We only call this at the very beginning, and we only do it exactly one time. On the other hand, this for each loop happens several times. So how many times does it happen? Well, it happens once for each genre and genre list. And we can see here that there are one, two, three, four items in genre list. So in total, we have one, two, three, four plus one calls to analysis, which means that we have five calls to analysis. And since each call takes one hour, this whole thing takes five hours. Now note that this is a linear growth algorithm, which means if the list is of size n, this genre list over here, if it's of size n, it means that as the list gets bigger, so for example, if n goes from four in this example to 10, it'll grow by six. It'll take six more hours. So as n gets bigger, it will linearly take more hours. This is a linear time algorithm. In this problem, we have a list, and the list has n elements, right? So everything is going to be looking at this list in terms of n, which is the number of items in it. It also tells us that n is a very large integer. Now, this actually doesn't really matter in this problem, as you'll see. It's kind of an extra detail. It doesn't really affect the problem either way. It proposes here three different algorithms. So in the first algorithm here, it says that the algorithm will access each element in the list twice. Now what this means is that if we have n items in the list, it's going to access the list two times, which means that the total runtime will be two times n. Just call it 2n. Note that 2n, by the way, is still considered linear. Unlike n squared, which is quadratic, 2n, 3n, 5n, 100n, any n is just linear. Now the eventual question is going to be which of these run in reasonable time. And as we know, linear time, any polynomial time, constant time, and logarithmic time are all reasonable time. This one's linear, so this one certainly is, right? Next up, we have one here that looks at every element in the list n times. 
So we have a list of n, and we look at each element in the list n times. That's actually just going to be n times n. You can think of that as kind of like a grid, right? On the top here, you have items 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here on the left, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And you might think of each of the items over here, right? So for each of these, we look at each of these. And you can think of this maybe like as a multiplication table, for example, right? So that all the way at the end, we would have 25. And all the way here, we have 1, right? So this will be 25 items, n times n. When n is 5, this would be 25. Now, since n times n is n squared, we know n squared is just standard polynomial time. So this is certainly also a reasonable time. Now, let's take a look at this last one here. It says, an algorithm that accesses only the first 10 elements in the list, regardless of the size of the list. This is trying to trick you a little bit, but that just means that it's got an execution time of 10, which we know is constant time, which very much is uh, the easiest of the reasonable time algorithms which means that this one, too, is reasonable time, meaning the answer is 1, 2, and 3. Now, this problem can be a little tricky because what we have here is it gives us a table, and in the table it tells us for each of the number of items in our list, which it defines as n up above, it tells us the number of steps that it takes. So, for example, if we have 10 items, so if n is 10, the number of steps is 100, and if n is 20, the number of steps is 400. Now, you might notice there's a really clear pattern here. This is n squared, right? Take a quick look at it. You'll notice that these numbers are just this times itself, right? So for example, 100 is 10 times 10. 400 is 20 times 20, right? In other words, these are just the numbers times themselves. We know this is n squared. And by the way, if you're wondering, well, how am I supposed to figure that out in the exam? What kind of patterns, what kind of math am I supposed to be doing? Generally, they're going to expect you to be able to look out for certain patterns like this. Like be familiar with what something times itself should look like. In this case, we know that these are n squared, so we know that it's a polynomial time algorithm, which means we know that it runs in reasonable time for large values of n. Based on the values in the table, which of the following best characterizes the algorithm for large values of n, we know that it runs in reasonable time, because n squared is polynomial time, which is reasonable time. All right, here's actually a really tricky problem. This one looks simple, because it looks like it's just a continuation of the previous one, and in a way it is, but it's actually got a little bit of a twist which is that uh, these might not be the way they seem. So what we have here is we have a bunch of different algorithms, and what it shows here is they have different runtimes, right? So for algorithm A, it takes, for different list sizes, it takes 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 different steps, and then it has list B, list C, and list D. Now what it's asking is which of these run in reasonable time. Now the problem with this is actually that it's pretty tricky because the numbers seem to suggest that, for example, algorithm B is very fast. But let's take actually a quicker look. Let's start with algorithm A, actually. If list size is n, we can see from algorithm A that it's a pretty clear pattern. When from 1 to 10, from 2 to 20, you can see that it's clearly 10n, right? 1 times 10 is 10, 2 times 10 is 20, etc. Now let's look at the second one here, because this is the one that looks really tricky. Now it looks like these numbers are pretty small, and from a first glance, it might even seem like this is the most efficient of these algorithms. It's actually quite the opposite. Let's take a quicker look. You might notice from these that the numbers actually look pretty familiar. It might be a familiar pattern, especially if you remember back in binary. This is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. These are powers of 2. 2 is 2 to the 1. 4 is 2 to the 2. 8 is 2 to the 3. Clearly what we have here is 2 to the n. Now I recommend very strongly that you try to remember this pattern of numbers, the powers of two, because you'll see them show up pretty regularly. Even numbers that are kind of close to them, like maybe it'll come up as, you know, one, five, seven, 15, 31, things like that, just off by one. Just uh, keep remembering this pattern. So this one here, as we see, is two to the n, which we know is exponential, and we know already that that's a problem. That is something we will not expect to be reasonable time. Now what's tricky here is actually that for these small input sizes, for example, for an input size of five, it looks like algorithm B is actually faster than algorithm A. Even though algorithm A is linear time, it should be pretty fast, but right, you see that 32? Looks like it's a lot faster than 50. 
Now, how can that be? Well, it turns out that if you were to graph these out, I'm trying to do here, algorithm A might look something like this, right? It's going to go up pretty steep, whereas algorithm B initially might go up initially less steep, but eventually it's going to way supersede algorithm A. So you see that there's going to be a certain point where it's just going to keep growing much, much, much faster. And that point would happen right over here, right? So this would be your, your exponential right here, right? Whereas this right here would be your linear algorithm A. Because of this, we need to really notice that algorithm B is an exponential algorithm and it will eventually grow really quickly, even though initially it does not. So let's take a look at algorithm C. This one's a little bit of a harder pattern to discern, but if you try different patterns that you know are reasonable or unreasonable, the first one that might come to mind is factorial. So what would n factorial look like? Let's look at n factorial. So n factorial is, of course, let's say for five, would be five times four times three times two times one, right? So this would be 20, 60, 120, right? And for the value of four, it would just be four times three, which is 12, times two, which is 24, which is this right here. So you see that this is clearly n factorial, which we know is not a reasonable time algorithm. I highly recommend familiarizing yourself with a pattern for factorial numbers uh, up to about maybe seven or eight. It's not too hard to remember those numbers. Now let's look at algorithm D. This one should also be pretty familiar. This is clearly n squared, right? We've got one, four, nine, 16, 25. You, knew, you, you can see these are perfect roots, right? So you can see here that this is one squared, two squared, three squared, etc. And we know that two squared is polynomial time. So we know that this is also a reasonable time algorithm. So therefore, the two reasonable time algorithms are algorithm A and algorithm D. So when you see a problem like this, try to see what is the runtime of these different algorithms based on the numbers that they give you. So now that we've seen a lot of reasonable and unreasonable time algorithms, the question that we commonly ask is, well, what do we do about these unreasonable time algorithms? So it turns out that even though sometimes it takes too long to solve a problem optimally, sometimes it's very simple to find an approximation. In fact, for a lot of unreasonable time algorithms, we can come up with an approximation in very much reasonable time. This is what we're going to talk about next, and this is called a heuristic. So this question is asking, which is the most beneficial use for a heuristic here? Right. So the first one is asking, uh, when a problem can be solved in reasonable time and an approximate solution is acceptable. So if you can solve a problem in reasonable time, it's unlikely that you will need a heuristic. That's not the best use of a heuristic there. When a problem can be solved in reasonable time and an exact solution is needed, if you need an exact solution, then you cannot use a heuristic. Heuristics are non-exact solutions. When the problem cannot be solved in reasonable time, and an approximate solution is acceptable. So these are the two conditions for a heuristic to be most appropriate. If you can't solve the problem in reasonable time, it's an unreasonable time problem, and therefore you will need an approximation, but you also will want to make sure that it's okay to use an approximate solution. So this one fulfills both of the conditions. Let's look at the last one. Problem cannot be solved in reasonable time, and an exact solution is needed. So unfortunately, this is a situation where you won't be able to solve that problem because if you need an exact solution, then it's not going to be good enough to use a heuristic. All right, let's do another one about heuristics. So this problem has a lot going on as well, but really all we need to know is this. We have two algorithms. One of them is not going to run in reasonable time. That's algorithm one. However, algorithm one is optimal. It generates all outcomes and it does select the shortest possible route. So algorithm one is the unreasonable run but that calculates exact answers. Meanwhile, algorithm two does not guarantee the shortest possible route, but it runs in time proportional to n squared, which we know is polynomial, therefore reasonable time. So algorithm two is clearly a reasonable time heuristic for algorithm one. Notice that the details behind what the algorithms themselves are doing here isn't important for this problem. It just is extra details. The important part is that one of them is unreasonable, the other one is not, and one of them is exact and the other one uh, is not exact. So this one asks, what can we say about algorithm two? So the first one A says, algorithm two attempts to use an algorithmic approach to solve an under, otherwise undecidable problem. Now this is where I really want to make sure to note that undecidable is not the same thing as unreasonable. 
We're going to talk more about that in the next three problems, which talk about undecidability. But undecidable and unreasonable time are very, very different. So here we're clearly just talking about unreasonable. Algorithm 2 uses a heuristic approach to provide an approximate solution in reasonable time. This is correct. Algorithm 2 is clearly a heuristic, and as we mentioned above, it does solve it in reasonable time because it's n squared, which is reasonable time. So algorithm B is the heuristic, and this is correct right here. So algorithm 2 provides no improvement over algorithm 1 because neither algorithm runs in reasonable time. That's incorrect because this definitely does run in reasonable time, uh, and as such, it's an improvement in a certain way. So this is not correct either. So algorithm 2 requires much faster computer in order to provide any improvement over algorithm 1. It's actually the other way around. Algorithm 2 will run in a less fast computer because it is a heuristic. So the answer is, so now let's move on to decidability. All right, now we're getting into the real theoretical stuff. Now we'll talk about undecidable problems. Now, this topic confuses a lot of people, and a lot of people are very daunted and intimidated by it. But there's something very straightforward about it, that if you understand this concept, you can get undecidability very, very straightforward. So the idea is that there is a certain property that algorithms have. So this question is asking, which of the following best explains the ability to solve problems algorithmically? Now, there's one thing, if you can only remember one thing about algorithms, and that is point D right down here. Remember this as a definition. There exists some problems that cannot be solved algorithmically using any computer. And that might be a problem that you can solve 99.9% .9 of the time, but that 1.1% of the time that you can't solve it means that there is some situation for some problems that you simply cannot solve, right? This is the property to remember when it comes to undecidability. A problem is undecidable when it cannot be solved for some set of inputs. We'll talk about what that means, that latter part means in the next problem, right? This is the answer though to this question right here. Remember, it's so important, I will repeat it one more time. There are some problems where there is not an algorithm that can solve them. We'll look at an example of one of those problems actually right after this one. Now this problem actually starts out with what I would consider to be a little bit of an Easter egg, which is that they're saying that they're trying to create an algorithm to determine whether or not given any input, whether or not it's going to go into an infinite loop for that input. Now this detail is actually not necessary for this problem because they go on to tell you right after that that the problem that the student is attempting to solve is considered an undecidable problem. Now the reason it's a bit of an Easter egg is because what they're actually describing is the halting problem, which is a problem that was proven a long time ago to be an undecidable problem, formally and famously, by Alan Turing. Now, here's the thing. You do not need to understand for this class why this problem is undecidable. You don't need to know that proof. In fact, the proof is very complicated. You can look it up. Uh, some of you might understand it, but that's not necessary to understand this concept. What you do need to understand is that there are some problems, such as this famous halting problem that sometimes will not give you an answer. For the infinite loop one, without understanding the proof for the halting problem, one thing you might consider is that if the problem does go into an infinite loop, it's really impossible for you to know whether or not it's infinite looping or just taking very, very long, right? So this is an example of a problem where we can't actually determine whether or not it has an answer. Therefore, it is just like the last problem. The answer is again D. And it's the same answer, which is, it is not a problem to create an algorithm that will solve the problem for all programs and inputs. Now, notice that in this problem, some of the inputs will actually work. So let's say that the program is trying to see whether or not you have an infinite loop. And all it does is check whether or not your program ends. If your program ends, which many programs end successfully, it'll say it doesn't have an infinite loop. It's successful but there are some situations where it cannot actually determine the answer. If it does go in an infinite loop, it cannot get an answer, and therefore there are some situations, some inputs, where your program will never have an answer. That makes it undecidable. Undecidable means there are some situations where it does not have an answer. Notice, by the way, very importantly, and I will mention this a couple times, this is very different from an unreasonable time problem. Unreasonable time problem will eventually finish. It just might take an eternity. It might take trillions or more quadrillions of years. It might take several lifetimes and eventually you'll get an answer, but it will eventually complete. All right, we're in the home stretch now. So the last one, here's one more problem about undecidability. 
So this question is just nice and simple, which is which of the following will demonstrate whether or not the problem is undecidable? So how can we see if a problem is undecidable? So let's look at these one by one. So A says, show that for one instance of the problem, so just one instance, an algorithm can be written that is always capable of providing a correct yes or no answer. So this is definitely not good enough because just because you show that it works sometimes doesn't mean you can prove that it works every time, right? Again, I mentioned that earlier. You might give one situation where it works, but there could be another one that you didn't try where it doesn't work. So B says, show that for one instance of the problem, no algorithm can be written that is capable of providing a correct yes or no answer. So this would define what an undecidable problem is. This is the correct answer. Uh, note that it doesn't go into details about how you can do that. Turns out that's actually pretty dang complicated. And it's way beyond this class's scope to understand how this works. But you can know that this, if you are able to do this, that you are proving that the problem is undecidable. Uh, let's just look at C and D. Show that for one instance of the problem, a heuristic is needed to write an algorithm that is capable of providing a correct yes or no answer. So here's where I really want to set the distinction that heuristics are for unreasonable time algorithms. So algorithms which are undecidable, a heuristic is not necessarily appropriate for those. Heuristics are for programs that do not need an exact answer that would otherwise take too long to complete, even though eventually they would complete. So heuristics are not relevant to undecidable problems. So D says, show that for one instance of the problem, an algorithm that runs in unreasonable time can be written that is capable of providing a correct yes or no answer. So this is once again, trying to trick you into thinking unreasonable time and undecidable are the same thing. Uh, so this just basically is saying, find me a program that can give you an yes or no answer that proves that it's undecidable. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? So once again, the answer is B. Just prove that there is some situation where you cannot get an answer. And with that, we finished this section on algorithmic efficiency and on undecidable problems. I would say this is the most difficult part of the current curriculum for APCSP. There's a lot of math, a lot of complicated stuff here. So if you went through all of this and you got all of that material, really great work. Thanks for watching. I'm Flavio, and I'll be back with more soon.